you know, how do we make it easy for people to remember, right? The, they know the genes and there's a genome, right? Yep. And so uh, essentially your exposome, right, is, is that unit that refers to your environment, your total exposure to the environment. So the genome is to your genes and your exposome is to your environment. It, right now, it's at the level of metabolome because it's what we can prove, right? It's what we can show objectively that here, here is what's improved, right? Uh, it, it's like, I don't rely on anything subjective, but usually, and uh, the case is like, I'm feeling better, right? Uh, I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm feeling better or I feel so much better or some, some um, husbands, uh, would go, I'm only here because my wife uh, told me so. And then they would come six months later and they go, Dr. Ted, you know, I thought I was already feeling better, but I didn't know that it was possible to feel this way. So I tell them my goal actually in, in getting you here is to get you addicted to the feeling of wellness. So you know that when you get off balance, you know what yeah. it is that, uh, um, that you're off balance, right? Why, you know, uh, people say they, they're biohacking all sorts of things, right? This yeah. is a framework by which you can make, you can hang all of your hacks. You could look yeah. at epigenetics, you know, uh, bioenergetics, uh, microbiota, uh, microbiota, mitochondria, uh, exposomics, chronobiology, evolutionary medicine, and you could hang all of your hacks in there yeah. in a logical way, right? There's a logic. Yes. Now you're not just saying, Oh, it's, it's because they're saying it's good for me. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. I am so pumped for this episode. We're going to be talking about health optimization. We have Dr. Ted Achokoso joining us on the show. Hi, Ted. Hi, Alan. Thanks so much for coming on the program. I'm so pumped for this. I adore everything that you're doing with synthesizing our most cutting edge technological advances in understanding our biometrics and optimizing our health. And that is just going to be so paramount for economic efficiencies, for intelligence and artistic efficiencies. So I am pumped. And you are so optimistic with the way you say that. You know, my putting all of those together is just with my frustration on how we have all, all of these sciences that have advanced, but we're not using them in the clinics to optimize our health. You know, we're just yes. all doing disease, disease, disease. And I'm fed up with that. So <laughs> Me too. And same thing with all these other brilliant um, scientists and 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 doctors and and people that are really at the edge of biotech that know what you know that you're sh going to share be sharing with us is that they're fed up with that and we're co we're we're coming in uh, hot for the future right now. Um, for those that don't know Ted's background, I'll read it to you guys is that he is the global founding pioneer of health optimization medicine and practice home hope which detects and corrects imbalances at the level of the metabolome, leveraging multi-omics, epigenetics, bioenergetics, gut immune systems, chronobiology, exposomics, and evolutionary medicine. He's also the founder of Biobalance Institute in Manila, providing proof of concept that health optimization medicine and practice is an economically superior clinical practice. He's double board certified in nutritional and anti-aging medicine with focus on AI, medical informatics, and mathematics of consciousness, and wrote the first ever connectome of C. elegance into a book. And you can find all of his links in the bio below, homehope.org, biobalanceinstitute.com, as well as troscriptions.com. All right, Ted, I want to start with this is probably the most important 
um, first place for us to start with, and then we're going to get into what we were talking about in the intro is how did you at such a young age, because we, we talk about this so much on the program is parsing for signal and inspiring young kids, especially to parse for signal related to not only what are the most uh, ancient spiritual understandings of metaphysics and the nature of reality, but also around what are the most cutting edge sciences and then bringing those two together and, and also the kids unique gift and identifying that you at such a young age were able to figure out how to get, how to, how to parse for that signal and became and achieved all of your medical successes so much earlier than most people do. How did you figure all of that out? How did you begin parsing for that signal at such a young age? Actually, um, and I have said this before, and I, I insist on it, uh, especially on children, it's not to stifle their curiosity. You push your kids and younger people to be curious about things. And for the parents, not to be to provide pat answers to things like God made this and God made that and suddenly you know the child becomes lazy what I call intellectual sloth that plagues our society right you, you allow them to discover you allow them to get bored and they watch a cutter a caterpillar and then they wonder what happens to a caterpillar you know it, when you when you couple that with the proper guidance and you know a certain industriousness on the part of the parents or on the teachers to nurture the curiosity with the proper facts right then you could actually instill in in, in a child that there are certain patterns that nature follows yes right? and then they when and then when they realize that the nature follows um, certain patterns and um, then they could realize that okay then there is such a thing called mathematics that is the science of abstract pattern right you could see that they could you could abstract for example x plus x equals 2x then one apple plus one apple equals two apples right yes, yes. Uh, and but then when it's uh, y it's uh, you know x plus y is so a one apple plus one orange equals one apple and one orange, then you could immediately see that uh, the pattern can be immediately abstractable. And then you, you instill the, in them a, a love for abstract patterns. And uh, that, that, will, that will spur them into you know, more curiosity about, well, what other patterns exist. And pretty soon, you know, for mathematical purists out there for example they really love the beauty of uh, being able to abstract those patterns and they make these discoveries that way but for us who are you know i'm i'm uh, undergrad in biology right and and uh, for me it's uh, looking at the uh, what fascinates me and what drives my curiosity always uh, even as a younger child is how did we evolve you know how did we come to be this way what were the factors when there that's why for example, an interest in evolutionary biology is, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it should be taught to everyone. You know, um, uh, yeah. evolutionary biology should, should be taught to every, uh, 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 every everyone because it shows you how we evolved. How did we get here, right? And then, as you mature, you should be taught uh, the new field now. There's a uh, new field called evolutionary psychology, right? Yes. Why do we why do we behave the way we do? Yeah. And uh, when you see that, that's uh, shaped by evolution, and it's also sh and, and uh, evolution is shaped the way the brain is wired, the way we're wired, right? And then, um, and then for us to be understanding the economic uh, economics where we're in, everyone should be taught, you know, uh, game theory, evolutionary game theory. You know, these yeah. are things are fundamental, but you could yeah. see what I'm driving at. Right. Yes, yes. One is the capacity to see patterns. What's the definition of genius? Right. Yes. Uh, is is uh, the capacity to see patterns where others say that there are none, and the patterns exist. Right. And the definition of madness is the capacity to see patterns where others say that there are none, and there are really none. Right. <laughs> so, so there is that thin line. Uh, yes. But. Um, and even if you take a look at IQ tests and all of that kind of stuff, you know, it's really your capacity to, to uh, see patterns and to do abstractions with those patterns. Yes. And those, the clearer you see them, you know, uh, the, faster, the faster you are at looking. So um, I have this concept, Alan, of 
what I call, I like verbizing nouns. So, uh -huh. <laughs> and I, I, I love fractal mathematics, right? So, yes. um, um, you know, I look at the core pattern, you know, what gets iterated over and over, what gets repeated over and over, right? So for evolution, it's really very simple. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a random variation and natural selection, right? And that's Darwin's version. But now we have already abstracted that. Right, so we have we have essentially random variation and you know um, uh, environmental selection, but the unit of selection now differs, right? So for Richard Dawkins, for example, you could see that his unit of selection is a gene, is the gene that's being selected for. Yeah. For Darwin, it was populations, right? And um, I was uh, hearing uh, an evolutionary biologist from Harvard actually interpreting this all wrong. You know, uh, that the, the unit of selection in Darwin's case is not the individual, it's the population that's being selected for, right? It's, it's kind of like pre-industrial England, right? Uh, when when um, there were lots of white moths and then suddenly with the industrialization, there, were, there was a lot of soot around. Right, and suddenly the black moths started to getting selected for because they could conceal better, and the white moths started getting eaten by the pigeons because they could be seen. Um, they could be seen, right? So you could see very easily that uh, these are the kinds of things that um, that uh, 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 selection does. But the unit of selection is different. For memes, which was introduced by um, yeah. by uh, uh, Dawkins, right? Yeah. Um, not the bastardized internet meme that we have now, but it's yeah. the unit of selection for society and culture, right? When you are going to school, they, what they're doing is they're transferring memes, right? And memes are yeah. be behaving like genes. They're like viruses. They totally. transfer, yeah. right? <laughs> and these are, these are like, you know, um, sayings, uh, like, like maxims, like, uh, you know, the early bird catches the worm, right? Yeah. And yeah. I like to bastardize that a lot. I say the early bird catches the early worm. Because you could see how these little memes would affect your behavior, right? Yeah. So, um, so you could see that it all stems from early on uh, pushing, uh, pushing the curiosity, um, allowing for uh, the child to identify, you know, that there are certain core patterns there that get repeated, exactly. even if it's hidden, right? Yes. And then an abstraction of that pattern to something else that's manipulable, right? Yes, so, yes. So now you could see a child growing to manipulate, you know, uh, a, a geometry of 64 dimensions, you know, which you could never imagine, right? It's <clears throat> because introspection is usually all wrong, right? <laughs> you, because you cannot imagine a, a geometry of uh, something that has uh, 64 dimensions. But, uh, you know, sure, there, there are, there are uh, geometries now that are occurring beyond space and time. So, you know, um, if you, for example, it occurs to them that, hey, you know, I can regard space and time as an illusion and physics is finding now that space time is an illusion. So you could see the ramifications of that are very vast. And we need ki these kinds of motivations for the younger people, not just to fucking survive and reproduce. Yeah. I mean, because that, that's ordinary. Right? Yeah, that's so, so ordinary. That's ordinary. Yeah, that says this. We do we, this within two standard deviations. As as as, as yeah. I like to say, you know, if that's what we do, and then we we destroy this earth, right? And then so we go in spaceships and colonize another livable planet, survive and reproduce, wreck that planet again, and go somewhere else. I think, like, you know, then we're not doing our job, right? We're, we're not doing a job in in determining where we want to bring our species to. And yeah. I, I presume that this is the reason why you want to bring out podcasts like this is that, you know, how can we have a species awareness that brings us forward to where we really want to bring ourselves to in relation to the network of other species that are out there in this planet? If it's our one and only host at the moment, right? And we're destroying it at a really alarming rate, you know? So, uh, and, and then from, and then from and then from there is, and then you you go back like uh, oh you know the the reason where those so many climate change deniers and all that is is you know I, I usually don't like to say this is it's just plain ignorance right it, it, there's a certain as Dawkins uh, likes to say you know there's a certain form of intellectual courage right 
yeah. in able uh, to be able to do this uh, to make these kinds of assertions that, yeah. and and that intellectual courage actually uh, for example if you're looking at climate change you have to have a fundamentals of um, of uh, uh, the second law of thermodynamics at least but who wants to know that let alone want to know the the structure of fermions and bosons and all and leptons and quarks we evolved right we evolved to like to know stories because it's as that's how we evolved for survival right and for reproduction so we like to tell stories around you know that's why we're good at conspiracies we're good at all of these uh uh things that have plots and motivations etc but we're so poor at statistics like for example you know the the amount of car accidents are, are a lot more than taking a plane, for example. And we, we cannot realize that, right? Because we are made for a nomadic group of five to seven people. We're not intended to, to take a look at populations. <clears throat> you know, certain laws are, are, are formulated that way or regulations are formulated that way. The, the seatbelt law, you know, Massachusetts didn't want to do the seatbelt law because it crinkled their clothes. Right, but uh, from a rational, uh, they were the last ones to enact it in law. But uh, you know, from 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 a from a rational point of view, means are you thinking statistically? And this is the effect, you know, from when you get child curious, and and then um, you know, superimposing science and and, and mathematics, you know, and uh, uh, and evolution, yeah. how we evolved, yeah, and how we came to think this way, then there is a chance for us not to think this way, to think in a different way, right? Um, yes. And, and so we can, we can think of different solutions, right? Yes. For uh, yes, yes. Uh, different solutions for issues. And, for, for the, and that's why, yes, for example, yes, for, yes. I was thinking about health, right? I, you know, we say we're talking about health optimization. I know you've already gone far, right? Let, like let, let, yeah, let me hit let me hit the ball back, and then we'll we'll keep we'll keep, keep going. This okay. This this intro segment has been really awesome. How how you explained when the child is uh, if has the full curiosity, fully enabled. And then also there is the guiding influence of, of intelligent parents that have understood that there are these patterns that emerge. And then by, in a sense, abstracting out those patterns into Pareto efficient ways of teaching the child about those patterns and also for the child to, they themselves watch those patterns and for them to fully embody the recognition of those patterns, including the patterns of things like why there is perennial spirituality around the entire planet pointing at the same nature of reality understanding. So then there's this big synthesis that happens for the kid as they follow their creativity and they follow their curiosity and they're understanding the science patterns and the spiritual patterns and they understand their own unique artistry role. I really like that. And also I like just the classical bell curve understanding where in that center is just this idea of, okay, uh, have fun and reproduce. And then on like, on the, on the, on the non-progressive side is still notions of wanting to own other humans or violence or kill. And then on the hyper progressive side, these strokes of genius, these kids that and, and adults that maybe two or three standard deviations up the bell curve are usually the ones that, like you said, are able to abstractly reason these patterns in new creative ways in solving the greatest challenges that exist in, in creating the greatest art. And I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, as, as long as, as, long as uh, the people within two standard deviations don't drown out you know, those people. Yes. And it's very easy to drown out because as people who are wired for survival and reproduction, that's the, even our symbolic manipulation is such, right? Yes, it's yes. easier to memorize the characters in your telenovela than it is, or in your daytime soap, than it is to memorize the families of Quark and Leptons, for yes, example. Yes, Because yes, they have no story, yes. right? 
Yeah, and uh, that's so uh, well said. So we need to tell oh. the story. We need to tell an exciting story that makes it even more fun to know about the families of elementary particles. And and, and beyond. Yeah. And, and beyond. Well, you know, and then uh, you know, make them question it later. Are there really families of elementary particles? Is there, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, like like uh, Donald Huffman in the case against reality in this uh, book, right? You know, is this really what it is? You know, uh, is what we're yeah. seeing what we're seeing, or is it? Yeah, not? yeah. Uh, um, and that's curiosity, right? And that's curiosity. I, I like your your point is very right. That center of the of the bell curve. If if the idea that I've been pushing around a lot is that the people that are in a sense two or three standard deviations up the bell curve, their general um, purpose, in a sense, also is to uh, help the people that are in the um, in the in the maybe one standard deviation or to zero range up uh, the bell curve to, to help them do a, a pull up in a sense to, to go to the next level. So basically, you know, like Eric Weinstein has the idea of the portal, like the idea that you can create a portal to help people in that center part of the bell curve go through the portal through these stories and patterns that we can disseminate to them to inspire them to move up the bell curve. And let's just let's just jump into because we could spend we could spend so much of our time in just that in just that section. It's just the beginning. Um, okay, in general, just, just one go little, ahead. yes, yes, just go one ahead. little thing. Uh, Sherrington in 1946-47, you know, uh, he had a he had a, a lecture, uh, uh, Royal Royal uh, Society, where he said that you know the movement of society as regards you know its science, technology, culture, mathematics, etc in any one of those fields, say physics, right? Um, it's like an amoeba. Uh, uh, it, you, it throws off pseudopods or false feet, right? Uh, you know, it, it goes in one direction. And all you need is just a few of those geniuses pulling and pulling and pulling, you know, until pretty soon the entire body of society is yes. moved forward. That's right. right. So, and, 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 and that's, if that's what the best that we can hope to happen. Yes, right? yes. yes. Uh, and what we don't like happening is like several of these pseudopodia being thrown in different directions. You want a strong pull towards one so you could pull, you know, yeah. the 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 sociocultural zeitgeist forward. Yes, yes, yes. You can yeah. pull the scientific zeitgeist forward. Yes, yes. Anyway. Yes, beautifully said. I love this first section. It was so powerful. Okay, now this ne this next section is kind of the the central um, ethos and thesis of what you represent, and I think that um, it's also what I represent. Now you mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and me, and me. Too. I mean, this is a huge pillar of what I'm passionate about, and have interviewed hundreds of people about this exact topic, and so. This topic is basically the idea that we are now able to take a constant stream of our biometrics and we are able to tweak where there is a imbalance in a sense, Dr. Aubrey de Grey uses the analogy, and you're going to give us some as well, of the fact that, like, why does a jet engine on an airplane have hundreds of sensors? But why do we see the doctor one time a year? Right? Yeah. So the, yeah. these types of things. And so, and, and, so, and so the future, and you're going to hit this back right now, is just that the fu th this is the future, is this constant stream, and then the ability to correct imbalances, and then for us to live healthier, moment to moment, healthier, stronger, uh, more creative, and also longer. And so that's this general idea, and we're going to get into a bunch of the subtopics on this, but yes, go ahead and... Um, and hit hit it hit it off. No, you, you you said, you know, you had all the the adjectives. You can live healthier and moment by moment, etc. Mm -hmm. I I just aim for one. I just want to live equanimously yep. with equanimity, right? Yes. yes. Um, uh, which is the highest form of love, and the highest yeah. form of love is peace, and the yes. highest form of peace is equanimity. So. Um, um, you, you, you actually already 
uh, hit on it when you know the jets have so many sensors. And we used to think that the body didn't have uh, as as much of molecules that can be sensed, right? And uh, when you go to an illness medicine doctor, essentially you already have a flat tire, right? Your your heart has already given out, right? Or you already have an overheated engine. You already have a fever from an infection, right? So as an illness medicine doctor myself, I'm a trained interventional neuroradiologist, right? Um, we know how to repair stuff. We we you bring your car to the you know, to the garage and we know how to do retrospectively, oh, this is actually, it's not your carburetor, you know, it's this, you know. And, and so our diagnostics are, are um, basically retrospective, right? So we know how to do repair, right? And we do repair, uh, our antibiotics have to work on populations. We're de dealing with populations all the time, right? Of, of uh, of uh, individuals because hey you know the technique for open heart surgery has to work consistently throughout the world right if you if you do it so but when you go and 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 do that you're just looking at repairing your system right and then the concept of in illness medicine of prevention is disease prevention so the, the, the diabetic society will say, this is how you prevent diabetes. This is how, and then the neurology society is, this is how you prevent Alzheimer's. And this is how you prevent, you know, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So if someone who has hypertension and someone who has cognitive decline and someone who has cancer and someone who has diabetes, you know, they will follow three, four different kinds of, of prevention guidelines. And yeah. what the hell is that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So notice yeah. I used hell, all right? I, yeah. I, I usually use another <laughs> yeah, yeah. expletive. But, but are you really expecting patients to do that? But it turns out that, um, you know, it, you know our, our cars are so much better now because every 3,000 miles just comes a warning light that says, okay, yeah. time for you to bring your car to the garage. And yeah. then when the temperature is rising, it shows exactly you know, yes. uh, what the temperature is and gives That's you right. a warning that you're about to hit critical level, right? Mm -hmm. Or when your tire pressure is going down, it it's, uh, uh, gives you the level of your tire pressure and which tire, right? Yeah. Uh, initially, we didn't have those kinds of diagnostics in medicine, right? So all we were taught in illness medicine was pathology, you know, what's the disease, you know, and how to repair it, pharmacology by yeah. drugs or surgery, <laughs> yeah. cut him up or do a combination of both, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so now- But we uh, also didn't have the access in terms of the instrumentation to see at that level. But now in the last really uh, like 100 years, we got be, this instrumentation. Because of the development of science and technology, right? We are now able to take a look inside the cell in fact, uh, there's a reason why my medical school classmates hate me, right? Because you're being dragged right back into biochemistry inside a cell. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas before, you couldn't measure yeah, those yeah. metabolites or small molecules, right? Yeah. Now you could measure them. Before, you will, you will just say, oh, just take vitamin C and just take vitamin E. <laughs> now I actually resent that question being asked of me. It's like, why don't you fucking measure it and then take it if you need it? Right? Yeah, because yeah. all of those can be measured now. Yes. It turns out that metabolomics, which is the omics that's in there, clinical yes. metabolomics, which is the use of it in the clinics, it's, um, it's already 40 years old, right? But it's only hitting the clinics right now. Wow. Right? Yeah. But when you are dealing with health, not disease, you must have some objective measure of what it is that's going out of balance. You know, it's a playbook from uh, illness medicine, you diagnose and treat disease, right? So in health, you detect and correct imbalances because there's no disease, right? And if, if there's a disease underlying that, you set the disease aside for the specialist and you balance the uh, imbalance of uh, hormones and nutrients and other metabolites that are in there, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, if you place those values between the values of uh, when you were 21 and 30 years old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Interesting. Then you're you at your, are, when yeah, you're at your peak homeostatic capacity. At your peak, right? yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Except for, except for values like 
uh, vitamin D, for example. Vitamin D is actually a hormone. I call it the hormone named vitamin D, right? Um, but so, so then do we have those a cat? Are, those, those are, go ahead, go ahead. Those are evolutionarily determined, right? So there are evolutionary determined values that came before us, right? And so there so, is this catalog in a sense yes, of, yes. of optimized, but then Alan's uh, 21 year old uh, catalog of, of, of biometrics for an optimized uh, um, equanimity and equilibrium and homeostatic capacity onward is different, is somewhat similar, but also different than Ted's. So, and yes, yeah. yes, but it falls within a range, right? It's usually yeah. higher. Your needs for certain things is usually higher, right? And right now, I've, I've seen, for example, um, uh, 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 21, 22 year olds with growth hormone levels of like uh, of that of a 70 year old. You know, you could see how how um, uh, how uh, we've changed a lot. Wow. Um, People even, in the even north more, uh, versus south, also geographically, right? Or in the by the equator, I mean, or versus on uh, towards the poles. They and, have, and yeah, 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 and and also, um, you know, it's not only that the uh, use of plastics, for example. The endocrine disruptor systems, right? They disturb your hormonal levels. Like, for example, they did a, uh, I think it was like 60,000 men in Europe, you know, between ages 21 to 30. And they found out already drops in testosterone levels, um, you know, which used not to be there. So what we use as a, as, as a range is not what you use for illness medicine, right? When, when, when clients or clients, because they're not sick, right or patients come back and yeah. say oh look my thyroid hormone is normal well that's just enough not to make you sick right yeah so yeah. it's like uh, in when you say in nutrition the rda or the recommended dietary allowance yeah. is just enough not for you to incur the deficiency but it's not the optimal value for you Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So let's, let's visualize this as well. You have a, you have a really good visual that I'll um, embed here, but you have this, you have this general idea of scale that um, we can envision here where you have an idea of what's happening at this quantum biophysics level. And then you have what's happening at the atomic level, at the molecular level, the macromolecular level, organelle level, cell le le level, tissue organ organ systems and organism so you have that okay. that increase yes, yes, and yes. then and then what you have is you have um at, at, it's it's really it's at this intracellular level is the focus mm. r right now and right. at this intracellular level there are three categories pretty much there's optimal suboptimal and illness and 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 you w what we're talking about is basically keeping your biometrics at the optimal level so even when they start going into what are called like these preliminary phases of suboptimal levels um that we can have those interventions to return them to optimal levels and these can be measured via let, go, yeah. right it's just yeah. like, you know, your windshield wiper um, uh, fluid is low. Top it off. That may be what? You have low levels of alpha lipoic acid. You have low levels of vitamin B1, B2 or something. And those are like the newer uh, dashboards now that you have. Now it's available to us. Unfortunately, it cannot, you know, those are the fundamental functions of cells. So we're made of organs and underneath the organs are the specialized cells, like you know, your, your beta cells in your, in your pancreas, for example, that produce insulin. But underneath all of these organs and all of these specialized cells, there's a fundamental cell that has to run. It has a nucleus, it has mitochondria, it has a cytoplasm, you know, it has endoplasmic reticula, you know, um, uh, you know it, and, and it has cell membranes and it has a cytoplasm yes. and no one's taking care of that and that's fundamental right yes, yes, yes so so health optimization is basically focused on health maintenance right it's maintaining like when you're looking at your dashboard in in your car and saying oh this is slow and that's slow you know or oh, this is this is uh, overheating oh i need to change oil now now we actually have the technology to do that, which is through metabolomics, right? And I chose metabolomics for two reasons. One, the tests for them are already mature, meaning we could prove to illness medicine people like, 
hey, look, you know, remember those Krebs cycle intermediates that you just used to memorize? Uh, here they are. Here are the levels. And usually they call me back and they go, Achakoso, what do I do with this? I said, ha. Ah. So anyway, because it's used for health, right? It's it's fundamental. So when you are doing health optimization, you don't do one organ at a time, right? You do the fundamental cell in all of the body. So, yes, you gave this really good example is basically if you go and you um, target the specific like pancreatic cell that is starting to have a little bit closer towards suboptimal. Yeah. What you do is if you, and I, and I want to see if you make the correction, it basically does all of the downstream much better. Yes. Now, now will you but teach us? I make us, no claims. Yeah. yeah. I make no claims because illness medicine will, will, you know, shoot me for that. And that's the reason why functional medicine, you know, has a lot of fights with other illness medicine doctors, right? But for me, it's enough to move uh, the, the values of your vitamins, your, your, your macronutrient uh, 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 components, like your essential amino acids and, and so on, and your, your uh, micronutrients, your vitamins, minerals, you know, and cofactors, and your hormones. If you move them to, to the optimal levels, then you see yes. the effects. Without correct. any claims, right? The, yes, it, yes. The system, it's, the system yes. tends to correct itself. Yes, it's like, it's like in very simple terms, it's like, huh, I've been sitting for a long time, my back hurts. And then you go and you swim and then you come, and then right when you're out of the pool, you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Yeah. So that's the intervention towards optimal at the organism um, higher level. Now, t Ted, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna ask you this. At, um, let's talk about this. How do we take a sample from my body to mm -hmm. gain the, the intracellular metabolomic knowledge of what sugars, what lipids, what nucleotides, um, yeah. et cetera, are, uh, are, are amino acids are, are there and what, um, and then where they're out of range. The idea is yeah. then some are out of range. And then how do you give an intervent? Like, how do you analyze that? Is that through mass, uh, spec, spec, spectrometry and then, um, from there, then how do you um, provide the intervention? So walk us through that whole cycle. Um, so um, what you do, they do is uh, they take uh, urine, blood. Uh, for me, I take stool samples because I have to take check your gut microbiota, right? They're a separate mm -hmm. organ. They're not considered a postnatal organ in the body, um, which, influence, which is a major influence on your immune system, right? Yes. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, so it's a blood, urine, and stool. Uh, okay. We s send them out to a metabolomics lab. Okay. Um, so, so essentially, they have all of this, um, uh, uh, you know, the gold standard right now is what they call the LCMSMS or the liquid chromatography um, mass spectrometry, but so it's already fast, like they're quadruples and blah, blah, blah. Yes, the yes. newer, uh, you know, and right now it's a race to provide, uh, to, to, to get to the protocols with the least invasive sampling. Like, exactly. for example, yes. you now know the that, sensor um, on uh, the toilet so that yeah, yeah, you don't even have yeah, to send it yeah. in. It just or, yeah. or, you know, Google's um, um, uh, contact lenses, right? Now you have the continuous monitoring uh, over here, but that's individual, right? Uh, that's uh, for, for individual use. If, if you're like weird like us who like to, you know, I, I puncture myself three times a week for my blood ketone levels and for my mm -hmm. blood sugar, even if I'm not diabetic, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so after that, so the, the, the results come in and what's nice is that they've already done enough statistical analysis to give you you know, uh, what is the suggested um, uh, amount that should be given to oh, the client? It's already there. However, you need to adjust, right? You, you need to, to adjust things. Um, like, like, for example, um, uh, uh, for example, you, you see, like, for example, the, the, uh, the zinc level is very, very high, right, for the patient. So you, you, for the client, Right and interseason, and you ask, you know, have you been taking lots of of um, uh, zinc lozenges? And yeah, it's artificially elevated. Then you'll see the copper dropping. Right, so you could see that uh, the system knows 
you know, th there are counterbalances to things. If you take too much zinc, your copper will drop. You know, that's just the way, you know, you, you will get balanced by through evolution, right? Um, uh, and so, so after that, then the way, so you, you come to me, the, the reason why it's nice is because this lends itself it, it lends itself to telemedicine, right? Or tele, telehealth practice. Yeah. Because you never have to see your client or you never have to see your patient because you cannot say, hello, how are you, molecule? You know, I, you know, how are you feeling today? You can't do that. You have to look at the values, you know, of the molecules themselves. What are the levels? Like, like you cannot say, hello, B12, you know, uh, um, what's your status today? You can't. Uh, but for, for most clients, uh, so essentially you, you take a look and you uh, essentially do a protocol for them, right? Which, which ones are be, to be taken um, before meals, as soon as they wake up, before they, before they take a meal, while they're eating, especially those who, who have taken too many proton pump inhibitors like Nexium and so on, you know, where you're giving them like a, a beta in a hydrochloride acid to acidify their stomachs, you know, and, and also, so there's a protocol that goes on and then so, things that you take after a meal, right? And then things that you take before bedtime. So because, you, you know, hormones follow a diurnal level, you know, there's a certain uh, uh, pattern to, to all of these things. Of course, yeah. if you take alpha lipoic acid before meals, your blood sugar will go down, right? And you will feel dizzy because it's a hypoglycemic agent. Uh, so you, you should, you know, that's why I, I started this whole health optimization medicine and practice in order to be able to, to teach this. The clinical practice is very simple. You measure the metabolites, right? And you know that they are in a network. If you touch one metabolite or you touch one hormone, the other hormone will, will uh, respond. That's why I don't like this. Oh, you should replace your testosterone without replacing all the other things that you need to replace, right? It's, it's a bad practice because they're all in a network. And as you know, my life is about networks. So, yeah. Um, and so you move the, you give them, I usually give them sup supplements for the first 90 days because even if they say, well, Dr. Ted, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna eat properly, I promise, and blah, blah, blah. And you ask them, okay, what foods are high in, in coenzyme Q10? And they don't know. Okay, what foods are high in uh, alpha lipoic acid? They don't know, right? So uh, for the first 90 days, just to catch up with the deficiencies, I, I tell them, look, you didn't get to these deficiencies overnight. This occurred over time with your habits, with your lifestyle, and with everything else. This is what it's showing. Let's catch up as fast as possible. So, you know, uh, uh, the improvement can come uh, anywhere with, within two weeks, like if you're doing hormone therapy or, you know, uh, three to nine months if you're doing yeah. uh, nutrient, nutrient therapy. And you, you, you're a measure whether or not you're actually addressing all the things like yeah yeah you know, yeah um, yeah because you, know, you, you you gain you, know, you gain it even after two because you're you're taking again because there's so many sensors right on this jet yeah, now yeah, that we're yeah. getting the frequent readouts of improvements yes, now yes. Ted, is there and, is there is is there like you said that you there is a there's the process of once the analysis comes back from the the metabolomics this multiomics analysis with all yeah. this mass spectrometry and liquid chromatography and stuff like that all this complicated technological equipment they come back and all these numbered readouts they're showing the they're they're comparing right you gave you gave this um really good example you said they're they're comparing the individual to the reference population so the yes. reference population is like thousands and thousands of people and the and the averages yes. and then your individual is either in the red or in the you know in the on, yes. on either of these two sides or in the screen and yeah yes yeah. at that particular age at okay? that age too yeah, that age, age specific age. it's very, which important. Is very important because for example right. yeah. uh, the uh, and and this is an example that i give you know most most people don't know that when you get a value of a, a thyroid hormone they don't know what the, the reference range is just there either you're hypothyroid or hyperthyroid and you're given a range right that's an illness medicine range what you know they didn't know that the way that got collected initially was that was the thyroid hormone levels of uh, uh, for anywhere anywhere from three years old to ninety four years old, 
So yeah. why should I rely on that particular data collection, right? Uh, yeah. How am I going to optimize if that's a range? Yeah, that's good for illness, right? But it's not going to be good for optimizing health, you see? So you have to go to the optimal range when your body was physiologically supposed to be at its best. Right. Yes. Yes. And then, so, and then now teach us, teach us about this. So if there's, um, a, a, you know, let's take me tw 27. Um, we say, we give my, um, continuous stool and urine, um, samples, and we're getting back the, this biometric metabolomic yeah. readouts. Um, now when, when we're, when you're consult, like, let's say you're consulting me as the client, um, right. This is, again, this is way pre, this is health optimization. There's no, um, this is pre any, um, any suboptimal levels. Um, now, now let's say that, um, when you get the readout b back and you're analyzing it and you see that there's maybe the beginnings of a suboptimal level here, or here now walk us through this process. How do you know what supplements for, for me or what, um, what physical interventions for me to go do, um, what nutrition, what sleep, uh, how yes. do you know these yeah, specific things? Okay. Yeah. Um, and now you're, are, you are now in the realm of lifestyle. That's why the other omics are in there. Okay. Uh, so when, when I get it, I, I treat it exactly as illness medicine doctors would do it. Right. It's like, okay, here's what you're deficient in, but I will move the entire network, not just one, right? You know that all of those, for example, there's the anti-oxygen regeneration network, right? It's vitamin E and there's, you know, lipoic acid and so, and vitamin C and so on. They're, they're regenerated by one another. You cannot just erase one of those antioxidants without erasing others. So you have to have a knowledge of how these things are wired together, how the, how the uh, uh, chemistry is networked by the body, right? To, to regenerate its own antioxidants, for example. And you, you have yeah. to know which particular, which particular amino acids, uh, you know, would be, uh, for example, you are, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I see that you, you lack vitamin B6. Automatically, I should know that you probably are also suffering from some form of um, a mild depression or just uh, feeling the blues, et cetera, et cetera, because uh, vitamin B6 is responsible for, is, is a cofactor in the generation of a serotonin uh, neurotransmitter. So there's a lot of stuff that yeah. uh, fundamental that you should be knowing you know, uh, when, when you're making this, uh, this protocol. So when you come to me, I look at that as a whole, right? It's not piecemeal. The difference that I do with illness medicine doctors is that, A, okay, I tell illness medicine doctors, here it is, here are the results. What they do is they try to just give everything. You can't, right? Because you have to know which one is networked to what. And that's your value as a health optimization doctor or practitioner is that's a yeah. value you provide is you know all of that, right? Now you also know okay. that these things are affected by nutrition. Your gut microbiota, for example, uh, in as little as 72 hours, you know, when you're eating, you, you travel to a different country and you're eating different food, your microbiota will change drastically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it will change its... Uh, the way the way it's absorbing food, you know, uh, the the it's like an ecosystem in there. Some of the um, uh, species will grow more, some will grow less. When you're in Italy eating too much pasta, you know, then your your carbohydrate lo loving uh, uh, um, organisms will uh, overgrow. You know, so uh, these are the kinds of things now that affect, right? Uh, so when you're like, for example, I had a I had a a patient, a client, in fact the doctor who loved eating canned food, right? And even if, even if tin is already banned in, in mm -hmm. the canning process, mm -hmm. you know, he's old enough to accumulate, you know, before the banning of tin, right? So you could actually see the tin levels, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why I don't emphasize the, the genome. 
it's because the genome, you cannot see mercury toxicity in the genome. Mm -hmm. You cannot see cadmium toxicity in the genome. Interesting. The farther, yeah. the farther you go away from, from the genome, right? So it's, it's yeah. genome, the proteome, and the metabolome. And transcriptome, oh, genome, transcriptome, yeah, proteome, yeah. metabolome, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so the farther yeah. you get away from that, the, the more you get into the physiological and the environmental effects. On yes, it, right? yes, yes, and, yes. And so now that's where the exposome comes in, right? The exposome yeah. is your total environmental exposure to yeah. things. Yes, like, yes. Uh, you know, to, to phototoxicity, the kinds of light that you use, right? The you PMF. gave you gave these examples uh, in the in the talk you used. Um, you used as your examples, you gave el el electromagnetic smog today is hundreds of times greater than 130 years ago. And 5G is coming around the corner. People have electromagnetic hypersensitivity, we, the stress on the living cells, disturbing immune yeah. systems, creating oxidative stress, inhibiting tissue repair. So what? So that's this, that's this exosome. Yes. Yeah, that's the exposome. So, so the role of a health organization doctor is to identify, you know, what is it in your exposome uh, that is beneficial or um, harmful to your health, right? Because part of your exposome is a nagging spouse. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, 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 the stress. It increases that, uh, cortisol. It, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's part of it. And even, you know, uh, they already showed that... Uh, you know, uh, partners who sleep, who sleep together where there's uh, one partner is snoring, they show that for each snore, you know, the cortisol spikes in the partner that doesn't snore. That's so, so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, the, studies like this have already been done and they're fun, right? But the, the, the thing is, they do have an impact on your health. Absolutely. Uh, um, the other thing- Or on, know, the, on, the, light, Rupert, you know, on the Rupert Sheldrake level, we could talk about it as like a morphic field in a sense. Um, yeah, in and, a sense. We're, and, and we're right there next to each other creating these exposomic uh, 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 interplays uh, between one another. And there's, there's no getting yeah, away have, from it. Yeah, yeah. I had the pleasure of actually meeting and uh, speaking with uh, Rupert Sheldrake in uh, Vancouver, uh, off the coast of Vancouver at Cortez Island. Uh, he was a guest of one of my friends and, or in fact, my best friend in D.C. And uh, we talked about awesome. this morphic field theory and all that stuff. Um, but uh, for me, it's like, uh, you know, how do we make it easy for people to remember, right? The, they know the genes and there's a genome, right? Yep. And so uh, essentially your exposome, right, is, is that unit that refers to your environment, your total exposure to the environment. Yeah. So the genome is to your genes and your exposome is to your environment. May, may I, I, can, easy way. I, I, yes. And I can give also a very um, brief genomics is what might happen. Transcriptomics is what appears to be happening. Proteomics is what makes it happen. And metabolomics is what is happening now or has happened. Okay. Like that. I, I like that's, that's what's useful, right? I'm treating someone now, so yeah, it's, I need to know what's happening now, right? Yeah. And uh, it's very much influenced by, um, you know, I, I use metabolomics as a, as a way to prove it. Right now, it's at the level of metabolome because it's what we can prove, right? It's what you can show objectively that here, here is what's improving, right? Uh, it, it's like I don't rely on anything subjective, but usually, and uh, the case is like. I'm feeling better, right? Uh, I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm feeling better or I feel so much better. Or some, some um, husbands uh, would go, I'm only here because my wife uh, told me so. But then they would come six months later and they go, Dr. Ted, you know, I thought I was already feeling better, but I didn't know that it was possible to feel this way. So I tell them my goal actually in, in getting you here is to get you addicted to the feeling of wellness. So you know that when you get off balance, you know what yeah. it is that... Uh, um, that you're off balance, right? And you, yeah. you emphasize now like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, simple lifestyle changes, right? Uh, yeah. you, like, for example, you begin to explain the um, mitochondria, that they're, the, they're bacteria inside your cell. You know, we call them organelles, but they actually have bacterial origin, right? They, they have their own DNA. 
uh, you know, um, there we have a, an, an average about 100 quadrillion of them in our bodies. You know, um, uh, our, our red blood cells used to have them, but uh, the mitochondria wow. sacrifice themselves in order for you to have hemoglobin, right? So, um, um, so and they power you up, right? Uh, they power you up. So you you know that um, you know way before this intermittent fasting, blah blah blah. Eleven years ago, I was already telling my clients that you know twelve hours of not eating anything will allow your mitochondria to divide and regenerate, right? Yeah, it's yeah. just like it's just like having a kitchen that you give a break. Exactly. Right? You're cooking nonstop, nonstop you know, yeah. and if you keep on eating and eating, you know, we're a shameful species. We have, we have a permission to eat, you know, 24 hours a hours day. Hours a day, yeah. Is, yeah, so, um, so if you just give it a rest of 12 hours, it will start regenerating. The amount right? of people and, that have successfully shed 50 pounds or more off of their body by just fasting and burning fat yeah. for extended yeah. periods time. And it's actually really beautiful to train yourself at young ages to go on a day fast, two day fast, etc., and feel what it's like to burn fat rather than glucose. Yeah. Right. They see, for me, it's like, uh, now you're giving them a scientific basis for doing, you know, uh, yes, at least, yes. uh, intermittent fast. And besides, you know, Alan, it's easier for me, for example, oh, I'm going to change how I eat. No, 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 you can't. What can you promise me that you can do? They can promise me a commitment to the time that they eat. So I said, well, you know, first try uh, a feeding window of, you know, uh, 14 hours. And then uh, the next week, reduce it to 12 hours and then 10 hours, you know, and then, um, you yeah, know, exactly. and, then, and then have a minimum of like, yeah. of like, um, you know, at, uh, eight hours, you know, that, that's, that's your feeding window. I don't like to use fasting because fasting sounds deprivatory <laughs> so yeah 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 exactly you're being, right? so you're yeah. your feeding window yeah. and i usually tell them yeah. they can eat whatever they want but then pretty soon they feel a lot better when they yeah. say how else can i improve my nutrition and then you introduce the concept of your microbiota you know your your gut microbiota they weigh about you know uh two kilos uh in there wow uh yeah. so there's a uh, thousand you know, species and, and, yeah, of bacteria yeah, yeah. That, so, so that have two million uh genes uh two thousand yeah. genes each two million genes which is a hundred times more than we have uh human wise so that's that's pretty impressive and yeah. the more important fact is that we now know that the gut the gut is actually uh, the largest uh, immune system of the body, right? When I was in medical yeah. school, it was the bone marrow. Wow. Now we know it's the gut because, because it is the, the gut bacteria that's actually teaching what's foreign and not foreign, right? Wow. Um, wow. So, so uh, you see these uh, this, uh, uh, reports, right? The case reports where, um, or, or analysis where uh, children born by cesarean section have a lot more allergies and immune mm, problems mm. because they, there's improper activation of yeah. their uh, immune system. So I have some uh, OBGYN, yeah. enterprising OBGYNs who know about this. So they put a gauze on, on the mother's vagina and they do the, they do the uh, cesarean wow. section and they put a gauze over the face just so that wow. there would be a, an inoculation of the uh, bacteria that was supposed to be there. Wow. Because what do we find, right? Um, um, what do they find in, in analyzing the, these children's bacteria? They find the skin uh, bacteria of the people who handle them first. Yeah. You know? How messed up is that? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, it's not supposed to be there, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, okay. Let, that's, that's, yeah. So there's, there's, there's bioenergetics with the mitochondria. You know, and then you could teach them about eating, which is microbiota and the gut immune system. Yes, and then yes. you teach, you know, we've spoken about exposomics, their lifestyle. And then you, you t tell them about their uh, sleeping habits, right? Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, sleep hygiene, because lack of, of sleep will actually cause memory problems. But Huge the, the pathology. Main, the yeah. main thing that it causes, evolution has learned this, is that the first thing that it does for any insult in the body is to get inflamed whatever it is yeah. it will activate your N, your nf kappa b right that's the that's the pathway that will that's the simple pathway that it will that it will uh, do because you know it has it has the um uh, the counter pathway to that to, to quell it as well right so um 
and, and, and we know that's the first thing that it does, right? So any, any insult, you see your, your inflammatory cytokines are coming up. These are molecules you know, uh, that, that, sign, that, uh, that uh, signify that your body is getting inflamed. Even a simple high sensitivity C-reactive protein test will, sh will show you that, right? That your body's inflamed. Even if you're feeling good, et cetera, et cetera, you see your HSCRP is rising, you know that there's stress there somewhere. And then you look back and say, oh my God, you know, I haven't been sleeping uh, really, uh, I've been traveling for the past three days. And I've been in different time zones, and you see your HSCRP shoot up, right? So these are the and you teach them proper sleep hygiene uh, and and so on. And you know, for um, you know that you actually eat uh, 200 calories more the next day when you lack sleep, right? Because the body feels that it's under assault; uh -huh. it needs more energy, and evolutionarily. If the body says you need more energy, so you eat more, right? It's yeah. it's not it's not like having the munchies, but it's <laughs> you actually tend to to eat more, right? And then um, and then yeah. uh, of course uh, this is the, this I networks idea that you're yes. talking. It's so yeah. deeply networked yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and it's at the cellular level, right? And the cells are talking to each other. That's why I say we're looking at the body as an ecosystem of cells. It's the holobiont perspective, right? It's a holobiont uh, perspective where, uh, whereas in illness medicine, we look as individuals as part of a population, yep. right? Because your, your surgical technique has to work on the population or your antibiotic has to work on the population. No, we consider you as the population of organisms. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, 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 your cells are bacterially derived. Yes, right? yes. You're, and your somatic cell is a result of an anaerobic bacteria and your mitochondria, which is an aerobic bacterium, that has a symbiotic relationship in the past, right? So, yeah, yeah. so that's, the, um, uh, that's the idea here. It's um, holonically layered, the human, and then inside of us is all yes. the complex, but then also outside of us is the civilizational influence. So yes. it's yes. Know, layered like that. And, and that's why when you're looking at health, it's impossible to look at you as a person. You have to look at you as a holobiont. You have to look at the, the, the human and all, everything inside and everything in the civilization outside all harmoniously affecting the organism. You, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. in, in, part, in, in fact, part of your exposome is the immediate, um, uh, the immediate uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, etc. around you. Absolutely. Right? So right now, you know, um, coronavirus is part of our exposome. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. There. But exactly. yeah. so, so normally uh, your own house with, with, will have its own specific, you know, um, environmental yeah. bacteria, right? That's very interesting. And you mentioned earlier something uh, interesting, which is Aubrey de Grey's model. And I, I really yeah. love the guy uh, and the way he thinks, right, uh, as a biogerontologist. But the model that, that he has actually lends itself really well to epigenetics, which is the last pillar. You know, we have seven pillars, right, of yep. health optimization medicine. And last pillar is the genetics. It lends itself really well because um, he says, like, here you are at a younger period, right? Say you're 21 to 30, your optimal range, right? And then at 30, your testosterone begins to decline. That's why I chose 30, right? Yeah. Because that's when the testosterone begins to uh, you begin to to uh, have to fall apart, right? Uh, and um, what what happens then is that you the chronic diseases begin to appear, right? Uh, diabetes, you know, metabolic diseases, uh, cognitive decline, you know, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, they all begin happening, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then afterwards, it's a period of disease and then death, right? And he says, what if we could move the cells back exactly. to before the time that the chronic diseases appear? Yep. That means that the cells would be at a younger age, yep, right? Yep, yep, yep. And yep. of course, you know, uh, you already know about the Yamanaka factors, right? Uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Professor Yamanaka of Japan identified four factors that yep. can actually make cells younger. Yep. And the most recent, um, the the most recent uh, uh, finding is that they can now actually make cells younger without erasing their identity, meaning they don't forget that they're muscle cells or they don't yeah. forget that they're nerve cells. And that's just uh, you know, a recent advance. But now we're taking a look at, can we, it's like uh, the, the best uh, metaphor that I use is actually quite 
ugly. It's like accumulating plaque on the teeth, right? And it's your epigenome. And, and then so your gene, genetic expression gets affected. Like, for example, if you smoke and you, you have all of these other uh, bad, habit, bad habits, you're, you're, you're um, you know, uh, poorly methylated or whatever it is, uh, toxic lifestyle they have, you know? And, and, and um, you, um, so when you remove that plaque, right? Then you could move the cells back to the younger age. Now, can we do that? The, the big challenge is that can we do that now for the entire body, right? And, and uh, so, you know, David Sinclair, you know, is uh, do, uh, now doing that for the eye, you know, uh, can we reverse the retinal, uh, the macular degeneration that occurs, right? So, uh, and uh, they, f they found out that the, in, in, uh, in their laboratory animals, they can do so, right, in a, in a closed environment. So it's no longer, it, it, it's not, no, no longer a period for us. This is no longer an anti-aging period. This is now a period of, age reversal yeah right? yeah rejuvenation and, and through youthful homeostatic capacity yeah. yes yeah. yes but you know it takes many years of, you know look clinical metabolomics didn't yeah. catch didn't catch up with with uh medicine until now until you know i, I i'm one of the people who's pushing yeah. hey these tests are yeah. now available yeah, yeah, we yeah. now we yeah. now can have a, a, a better dashboard by yes. which to maintain health Right. Yeah, yeah. I love the, the dashboard. That's why I never use. So good. Yeah. That's yeah. why I never use the term disease prevention. That's also illness medicine crap. Right. They look at populations. You know. That's why vaccines are within their purview. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so basically, the the dashboard maybe in the last like hundred years has been slowly getting more and more variables popping up on it, and right. and now the idea is that there's there's like sometimes like clinical metabolomics can maybe put up um, a significant amount of variables that are really crystal clear and crisp. And the thing is, is that um, your role and a lot of the time people's roles are to just grab people and say, hello, you can add 20 more variables to your dashboard now. Please go do that for all of your clients as soon as possible. Stop waiting. And my, my next kind of question around, around this is that, um, would it be fair to say that then, um, given a synthesis of what you're talking about with clinical metabolomics and what Aubrey de Grey and all of these other, um, of all of these um, rejuvenating to homeostatic, youthful homeostatic capacity, would it be fair to say that um, our synthesis of all of you guys in like the 2020s and beyond is basically going to be something like a, an, 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 an artificial general intelligence that has the entire medical corpus and all of the um, the 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 refer or the 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 reference pop, pop the reference population corpus, um, and that then takes in through sensors that are on my toilet and everywhere else um, that are going to be taking a live stream of all of those biometrics as my individual and then cross-referencing them with the reference population and then sending me um, interventions to continue having that youthful homeostatic capacity. That's, um, that's a utopian future, right? But okay. um, you must remember, Alan, that the reference range will be also dependent on your race and your geography. Yes. Right? yes. Uh, for example, we um, just did a show on, on, on population genetics when we were in China and um, Hu Feng Zhang was having that exact same um, issue with how there was only the European yes. data set. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's and, so and, and that's a problem also with uh, interpreting the genetics the genes right now, right? Because their references are either Chinese or European or, uh, uh, or North American, right? So, so each country um, will need to develop its own reference ranges. That's so interesting. In, wow. Yes. Every uh, country, because every country. Wow. Every country. That's are, so interesting. And even yeah, separate, even tribes in those countries. Look, yeah, they yeah. eat, they, if you, 
take a look, you know, what makes a culture? They well, we were just talking species. about the Philippines. Yeah. You were saying there's 76 dialects, right? Yes. Yeah. So then that means there's all of these different cult subcultures in the, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the, the cuisine is regional. Right? Yeah, cuisine yeah. is regional. Cuisine you know, is regional. Uh, there's a region that, that uses a lot of uh, coconut milk. There is a, a region, you know, um, that uses lots of just totally spicy stuff. Yes. You know, so so um, e even in those, you could wow. see already very. That's why in and this is what I say: when you're dealing with health optimization, it has to be individualized. We can only do case reports for you. What is being demanded of us is. Case work across populations. Say, dude, we don't work with populations. We work with the population of, of uh, organisms that is you. You are the ecosystem that we work with. And therefore, what is good for you is not necessarily what's good for the next person, right? We just have a fair idea of what the body does and what the body needs because it's more or less uh, universal that you know you cannot synthesize vitamins and that's why they're called vitamins because if you take them in right there are certain essential <laughs> there's certain essential uh, minerals that uh, have to be uh, taken in right um, uh, and so on and and uh, we know that we know that about our make and model as a human body right and one of the biggest problems that we have is that the Megan model of the human body is intended for the uh, Paleolithic period, right? It's not intended for now. We have created a world that is, uh, th that where our bodies are actually unsuited for, right? Artificial lights, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, polluted air and, uh, you know, not exercising, we used to, 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 uh, to walk, to work in the fields and, and, and so on. And even before agriculture, we walked a lot because we were, we were nomadic, right? So, so would it, would it be fair to say something along the lines of, to continue our analogy that's, I think, really flourishing, flowering right now, would it, would it be like that the vehicle itself is us in that sense? And there's a make, there's a model, there's a year. Yes. There's a year yes. too. You said yes. the age was very important. And then that the older vehicles were had the, you know, the dashboards only had a couple variables on the, uh, yes. and then yes. now they're having hundreds and we want to get that constant measurement. And the, in that, in that analogy, it would be like, you know, if you, if your vehicle is manufactured in the United States or in China or in South Africa or Germany or Kenya or wherever, it, it ends up being a, a unique to that yes. specific make um, for your vehicle. And you're going to eat those specific things, be exposed to those yes. certain cultural things, even yes. your language and, and all this type. Yeah, yeah. But um, from an evolutionary point of view, now we will shift from what you just said. Uh -huh. From an evolutionary point of view, right? We are actually, with the, the world that we have created is the world for Teslas, right? Gullwing, if you prefer those. Um, but our bodies, our make and model as human beings is a Ford Model T. Ah, okay. this is perfect. I That's see. Our, our body is a Ford, Ford Model T. I right? see. Yes. And, and the, the, the world that we have created is actually suited for a Tesla. Yeah, and, yeah. and so we're a brilliant species, right? We can, uh, what we do. We have no, we have no, our Model Ts have no seat belts and we're, we're on, uh, we're in the insane realm of the internet uh, with all of the, yes. yeah. And then, yep. and, and, you know, um, you know, uh, our bodies are not intended to eat Soylent, for example. Uh, yeah, we're all of the high fructose corn syrups and. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So we, we are intended for that period. So. What do we do? So, so for me, it's, it's, it's really simple, right? Now we have some technology. So for example, for your artificial light, control your lighting system. There are lighting systems out there now that can simulate you know, a 12 hour you know, or, or, or a sunrise and sunset and so on yes, and so yes. forth, right? If you're staying indoors. Um, the softwares on the computers yeah, for like Flux yeah. and stuff like that are very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, you could, uh, uh, you know, that's the reason why you use supplements is because you know that, that you are not going to be eating foods rich in this and that. So, you know, what, when your tests show that you need them, 
you take them, right? Because you're getting deficiencies in them because your body is used to take, taking them in food otherwise, you know, in, 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 in the olden times, in, in the Paleolithic times, right? Uh, so a lot of our make and model is made for that time, but we have created a world that is not suited for a make and model anymore. So what do we do? You know, we <laughs> respond by, you know, having air, air, air filters and air cleaners at our house, right? Making sure that our, our home air exchanges are adequate, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And making sure that our, we still have the same basic needs, like right? we need to go out to sunlight. If you cannot yeah. go out to sunlight, you know, like me, I suffer from seasonal affective disorder because I'm a tropical boy. I need really more sunlight. I have darker skin, yeah, right? Yeah. You, need, you need more um, higher levels of vitamin D. So what I do, I have a vitamin D lamp that has UVB. Interesting. And I expose myself to it. So you, you, you essentially uh, uh, compensate by using technologies that are available to you or um, um, things that we have invented, right? In order yeah. to compensate for it, because there's no going back, right? I cannot bring you to a time when there was no electric bulb or no radio or no electricity. You know, yeah, that's not yeah. possible anymore. So why not make your, you know, retrofit your, your home to be EMF shielded? Right. Um, uh, Interesting. You know, so, and that's, okay. that's the reason why you know uh, people say they they're biohacking all sorts of things. Right. This yeah. is a framework mm. by which you can make you can hang all of your hacks. You could look yeah. at epigenetics. You know, uh, bioenergetics, uh, microbiota, uh, microbiota, mitochondria, uh, exposomics, chronobiology, evolutionary medicine. And you could hang all of your hacks in there yeah. in a logical way, right? There's a logic. Yes. Now you're not yes. just saying, oh, there's, it's because they're saying it's good for me. Or if you want to help someone as a practitioner, say, right? Um, because I know that there will be less doctors interested in this and there will be more practitioners who actually will be interested in doing this. Is Now there's a logical way where you could hang all of your hacks. Oh, that belongs here or that belongs here. Yes, here. yes, so yes. You're not, you're not haphazard anymore with the way you do things, with the way you help your clients, right? So this I'm is doing this because X. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is super interesting on an on an economic perspective because we've been we've been rolling. I wanna I wanna hit still some um, really interesting points. That was our that was kind of our most heavy section, um, which is the thesis of of an ethos of what um, you care about and what all these great leaders in the fields of biotechnology especially care about now you sure i care about that <laughs> <laughs> well i want to know this uh, we, we we can end on this um perspective or um uh, on that we can end that section on this specific perspective around that which is it's very interesting how the amount of money that is sort of spent on this what like what like people like Jessica Zitter and other people have called like this end of life conveyor belt in palliative care. Um, and like people just having, you know, dying preferences and being able to like spiritually connect on their way out or all this type of different type of stuff. But also what all of the problems that we have with um, heart disease and Alzheimer's and all these other in cancers and all these other problems that we have um, that there's so much money that we can quantify that is spent on the disease uh, biomarkers versus when we spend them on these um, health biomarkers, health biomarkers, multiomics, these health biomarkers. Yeah. And then, so what's interesting is that, so there's both a significant amount of economic cost that we decrease on that downstream end, but then yeah. we also spend more money on this upstream end as well. So there's actually, in a sense, there's a continuation of great economic um, flourishing. So it's like you would subscribe in a sense to maybe a $5 a month or 10 or $20 a month or whatever it is um, plan where your constant stream of biometrics is being fed up into that AGI corpus um, that is then le taking your individual and cross-referencing that with the population and providing you with, with intervention. And, but ultimately, ultimately what um, you said in one of your graphics, which I really liked a lot, which was that um, 
it's so simple in terms of these, you know, if you do think about it, like you're continuing the analogy, like you said, the Model T itself that is now in the Tesla world, um, like we are, that you can do basic things to very quickly ramp up your Model T to be closer to a Tesla, which are basically the most ancient wisdoms are, you've said, um, sleep well, eat well, hydrate well, breathe well, move well, sun well, ground well, relate well, love well. And if you do those things, you can very easily work your way into a healthier. And this is the connection that I think we can talk about now. It's basically the connection between enlightenment and health or awakening and health. So the more in a sense that you recognize the the wadat al wujud, the unity of all being, the unity of all existence, that deep interconnectedness of all, and also that source that you come from, that you are that, we are that, and that the more that you really embody that, that um, the impenetrable peace and the causeless joy, and you basically stay in that state and you make art from that state, the healthier you are on all your health biomarkers. Yes. Um, uh, you you touched on something that's, uh, you know, what's uh, interesting is that illness medicine always demands proof, right? Uh, and that's because they're based on population based thinking, right? So when you're and there you're talking about quantity the quantity of people that have survived because see they're after survival rates right they're, that's that's their measure the the measure of the success of any intervention that they do is after survival rate so they're after quantity and for me i'm after quality right yeah. what's the quality uh uh one of the things that i learned early on um in uh medical informatics when i was uh uh, uh, doing, you know, uh, research on, on how much is the value of life and, uh, you know, in, in dollars, you know, how much is one life worth and all that. Yeah, we, we do those kinds of research. Those are done, right? Um, you, you don't know that uh, the actuaries and all of the people that uh, provide you with life insurance, those are all computed and those are all known, right? But um, when, you, when you look at all, all of this stuff, it's like, what is the quality of your life now? And the thing that I, I learned there is that there are outcomes that are worse than death, right? And we don't like to admit that, that there are outcomes wor worse than death, but that is already the finding of studies, what, in the 1990s, right? Uh, uh, we, we know that. And, and uh, you know, only the most ignorant of us would, of, of doctors would say, well, I have, I have the, uh, I took an oath. Well, you know, that's, that's just for Hollywood, right? Um, so we, we already have established that kind of thing. So we now have to turn our focus on what's the quality of life that we're living. And the quality of life that you live is actually inside you, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I remember John Kabat-Zinn uh, wrote a famous book, right? Wherever you go, there you are. So, um, so what's, what's that status of the default mode network inside your brain? Are you, are, are you yes. too self-referential all the time? Um, but for me, it's like, uh, what is, uh, you know, how do you live life with a sense of equanimity? And um, yeah. I was asked this question one time uh, is uh, uh, by a psychiatrist. He said, Dr. Ted, you know, your health optimization medicine model with these seven pillars is just brilliant. But how do you include spirituality right, yes. in, in uh, health optimization? And I said, oh, you know, it's really very simple, right? Um, uh, you know that uh, DMT is called the spirit mo molecule. Yep. So just give the person DMT and you solve the spiritual imbalance. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the fastest so, um, way to just <laughs> obliter obliterate the ego, obliterate the ego and, and just melt, melt, 
right into the infinite consciousness, just melt yeah. right into it. And well, then hopefully you can re-baseline. The big thing is to re-baseline after entheogenic experiences, unleashing the divine within, but then can you re-baseline to that well, level? Of well, re-baselining re is actually done through practice, like a meditation exactly, practice. Exactly, or, exactly. Um, or other practices that actually um, point out to you the illusoriness of the self. Right. I, you know, ego is a very heavily laden term, you know, that's Freudian. It's your sense of self-importance. But uh, so I, I tend to use this self-referential system uh, more than I use the ego. But people understand the ego because it's everything from which everything is centered. Right. But that center is an illusion. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's just created by the brain. It's, uh, it's part of a uh, uh, what evolved to give us a sense of continuity, but it's also the source of our suffering. And if you take a look at our website uh, for, you know, transcriptions is a brand of my company called Smarter Not Harder, right? And uh, if you take a look at um, our uh, mission there is to decrease suffering in ourselves and to decrease suffering in others, yes. knowing that there is no other. Exactly, right? beautiful. So, yeah. so, so we come to a definition of what's suffering, you know, uh, for me, suffering is really very simple. Um, you know, in, in, in common parlance for me, suffering is identifying with the self or, you know, getting lost with the thought, you know, you think the thought is you, right? Like, uh, so uh, there is someone that's owning the experience. Obsessed it's with that all someone of the that layers of identity that we that we put yeah. on as as, as but, onion layers, yeah, and that we yeah, have but, ever peeled off. We gotta to feel the source, to feel it, and live from that source. Yeah, and and, and for me, you know, I'm I'm I have less grandiose plans. Uh, you know, uh, I have a simple definition of enlightenment, which is you know the cessation of suffering, and yeah, which is source yeah. of suffering. The source of suffering is the, the ego, which is an illusion anyway, that, is, that clings to or is averse to certain things. So it wants this, doesn't want that, wants this, doesn't want that. And soon all of those wants, wants, wants accumulate, right? You want more profits. You want more, therefore you're going to pollute the oceans more. And therefore you're going to use um, child labor more. Therefore you're going to, to uh, traffic humans more you know, all in the name of want, 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 right? So, and, and therefore, for me, that is suffering. You know, uh, if you, the clinging and aversion of the ego is the root of suffering, right? May, may, well, I, the, I, I, Buddha I also ask, says ignorance, right? Yes, ignorance yes. Of there, there, there's, a, there's a balance here, and I'm, I'm curious how you align with this idea. It's called like the dreamed symphony in the sense that the infinite consciousness creates the dreamed reality that is that is this and then there's the multiverse which is all of the dreamed realities this is just one observerse and there's many other observerses happening an 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 infinite amount of illusory finity in a sense that is happening and so here you here here we have this this um dimensionless singularity that is uh, indivisible and it's indescribable the 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 Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. okay so we have that and then now we are the um the, the dream symphony and so here's the symphony that's happening now in the symphony i'm playing the violin but you're playing the trombone and then someone else is playing the clarinet and someone else is playing the cello and we're all playing different melodies and different harmonies and people that are playing out of tune are people like you described that are suffering. They're still suffering. They're still in the service to self mentality and people that are playing in tune are playing in the service to other mentality. Everything's in service They're, They've, they've a clear gnosis of the divine that they are. And, what, and what's going on. They have very clear um, seer of truth consciousness. How do you resonate with that dreamed symphony analogy? Man, that's fucking heavy. I, I, 
<laughs> but but I, I I mean the one thing that I, I you know I, I I you know I'm I I, I told you I was just with with friends here, and the one thing that I usually totally inject into all of these things is levity. You can never be too fucking serious about anything, right? Yeah, yes. And, you know, I, I, you know, my pedigree is in neuroscience, and I'm still a neuroscientist. And even I, I'm a physician. You know, even in uh, in, in uh, as a physician, I still deal with the brain. So uh, let's bring down. Uh, so for me, right, right now we're trying to. There's a twenty million uh, dollar prize now, the Templeton, to yeah. to um, uh, to uh, uh, elucidate the the. Uh, mechanism of consciousness right yeah, yeah. and one is the causal um, uh, uh, model which is the integrated information theory right and one is the uh, causal model um, or the non-causal model which is the global work workspace theory mm -hmm. among others right uh, you know because my interest uh, in this is still in in consciousness and then there's of course you know um, philosophers you know the, the you know they say well maybe it's a uh, panpsychism whether yeah. or not it's inherent or emergent panpsychism, you know, you don't know who wins, right? But, you know, my thing is, this is fun. And this is yes. my answer to your question. Yes. My answer to your question. Uh, ever since I was a kid, all the way to now. So my first uh, experience with uh, ayahuasca, for example, it, it's as if a rug was pulled from under me as a strict scientist, you know, just looking at the world with this, you know, and then you, it's yes. as if a rug is pulled out under you yes. and suddenly you see that there are dimensions out there yes. that were unavailable for you before, right? Yes. So, yes. so uh, and then it's easier for you to actually um, realize that the self is an illusion, you yeah. know, and then now physics is saying that space-time, we're losing space-time to be, it's an illusion, right? Yeah. And we, we now have, uh, have people uh, saying that all we're doing in this world is like we are just a user interface with fitness functions. That's Donald <laughs> Huffman, right? Uh, we evolved. We see an apple. We see this only because that's, you know, that's our user interface in order to, to, to uh, execute our programs or survival and reproduction, right? And uh, so, uh, but, but for me, the side guys, the spirit of everything else is a fucking game. Yes. You know, you when you you best enjoy the game. You know, when when you um an uh, MMORPG, massive multiplayer yeah. online role playing game. Yeah, and, and yeah, th this is what I this is what I say. You know, um it's very difficult to convince people, unless they have done programming, that what you believe in is not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, but the, the the biggest punch that I give them is that when you were a kid, you believed you believed in Santa Claus, right? Mm -hmm. And then you were able That's to right. shed that belief. That's so right. Other beliefs are, are harder to shed. Yeah. Right. And yeah. when you're programming, for example, if you set a global variable, if you set that God is true, then do the following. If Jesus Christ is true, then do the following. If if you know, Gautama Buddha is true, then do the following. So you could see that, you know, whatever it is that's set in there. That's right. It's, yeah, that's it's, right. It's, it's, it's programmatic, right? Yep. It's, it's, it's programmatic. super programmatic. But, but, that, but that's hard for us to accept, right? Because it's, it's easier if you take an integral view. So when, when, you, when you embrace all that is, and especially all 8 billion of these individual yeah. players and what they see as true as their scripts, if you have an integral- that, That's important, as their script. scripts. Yeah. But the thing yeah. is, they cannot see beyond the script. Right? If, and they, if they we can the augment their- awareness beyond the script to the integral embrace of this beautiful mystery and expressing unique gifts, then we are into that more harmonious world our hearts know is possible. Yeah, that's why can I combine some molecules that can balance the default mode network and the task, pass, task positive network in such a way, right, that 
it is evident to you that there needs to be no owner of the experience, right? That, there, um, that it is there only so that you, it provides continuity for you to have a story every day because that's what allowed you to survive in evolution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's embracing that, but going beyond that, right? Yes, yes. And when we notice that, I, I, I tell people this, that's why I, I, I tell people, you know, all of us should be educated after evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. We should be educated in evolutionary game theory. We don't yeah. realize that much of our behavior is dictated by that, you know? By why zero sum dynamics. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why is it, why is the tit for tat game? Why is it successful yeah. all the time? Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and so on. Like, like, but people will go, huh? Those are very difficult concepts, right? We need you to know, tell better think, stories, uh, which links us to the very beginning. When we tell better it's, stories, it's, about it's science, hard. It's hard to tell. Yeah. It's hard to tell engaging stories in science, right? Unless you engage them, and when when well, I'm, well, we have to tell the story, the big metaphysical story that is like, in a sense, like the Harry Potter of of you know, like that. Like when we can do that, then we can really inspire that. The uh, for yeah. example, you know, um, uh, right now, you know, we don't distinguish when we're teaching kids, we don't distinguish between, you know, teaching them religion versus teaching them spirituality, which are two <laughs> different things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We just shove in them and the same in we, these uh, types of, of religious neurosis. And they yeah. end up having the same religious neurosis as when- I'm There's a very what? clear baby in the bathwater that we can lift up y and, yes. yeah, and bring up yes. with the and, spiritual. And mind. that requires, and, and uh, you know- It requires a lot of good stories told, like- A yeah. lot of education. Yeah. It requires a and lot of education. Well, or, or what we can do is we can say, okay, how can we take that, what looks like a lot of education, how can we compress that down Pareto efficient into a couple of, you know, stories that can really awaken people? I think we can do that. And that's pretty much what not only this project um, is that will be. Oh, um, I, I, I don't months, know, Alan. You can just but, phone me. I'm kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, <laughs> but no, but th this is why we are so passionate also about the space of, um, you know, what like Los Angeles is doing with able to um, put together like the best animated content as well. Like why is, you know, Pixar's like Inside Out so popular or why is um, like Rick and Morty so popular in that sense. Can we make it into, you know, or like SpongeBob SquarePants for like the, the kids? Like, how can we tell a story that's so deeply, or like Game of Thrones and Harry Potter, that's so deeply interwoven with metaphysics, though, um, and that animation and storytelling? Yeah. That's what we're passionate about in 2021. Yeah. You, you, you can also do the flip side, right? Yes. I, tell what um, is that? What my, is my, that? My, 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 my friends know that I have an allergy to stories because they have always fucked us up. <laughs> you know, if they're just, we are predisposed to stories. That's why we have all of these conspiracy theories. We were born to gossip and, and, and so on. Um, uh, you can also do the flip side. Uh, like we can teach uh, children to meditate earlier, to yeah. have a practice earlier in a neuroscientific way, right? here is how you observe the contents of your consciousness, right? That is part of what I'm describing in terms observe, of metaphysical story. Yeah, observing, yeah, yeah, yeah. observing the contents of your consciousness, right? Uh, uh, early, right? Yes, yes. Realizing that the self right. is just another right. content of consciousness. Attention itself is another arising in consciousness. So you see yes. all of these arisings in consciousness and especially when, when you teach them to kids before they develop that, that uh, hardened sense of ego. Ego. You know, I want this, craving, I don't want that. I aversion. want this, I don't want that. Yeah. Is they have this skill to take a look at their desires and aversions and say, okay, should, will I follow this desire? Or will I follow, will, will I get rid of this because I'm averse to it? A meta there, consciousness. Yeah, yeah. There, there yeah. is a pause that happens, right? before they actually act. Or There's that pause. And so, in that pause, the entire destiny of your life outcome in the world, it happens yes. at that pause, yeah.
Yes, because uh, maybe it's you're gonna scream and yell at someone who is going to be, you know, the most influential figure in your life, and you lose it, right? Yes. So, yes. so it gives you that that uh, you know, it gives it stops you from being reactive into being responsive. Yeah, and all it takes is being able to examine. And for me, it's just a simple skill. It's it's difficult. It's a difficult skill. That's why you can turn it into a mental game, right? Uh, of of uh, being able to identify it's your thoughts, an emotions. In and, investigation and into the nature of your being. And Rupert Spira uses a very good modern day analogy, which is the simple screen. Because if you think about that infinite consciousness as your being as that screen, and then having all of the different cravings and aversions and scenes that come up of the illusory multidis multiplicity and diversity of objects and people, as as the as the scenes in the screen in the movie that you realize that you are that blissful eternal infinite screen that's always having these different um <clears throat> slices of the movie so i yeah you're right though that that first principle at the young age you know there is so many indigenous cultures around the world like the baby in their bathwater is the fact that they have what you described, which is that depth of, of truth, that depth of interconnection, that depth of unity, that depth of understanding the nature of their own mind. And, you know, Buddha was one of the best uh, indicators and Adi Shankara was another uh, massive one, Ramana Maharshi. These, they were excellent at, um, at that investigation. So, and, and I, I mean, Infants are, are, are fantastic. They're great until you fuck them up, right? Yeah. <laughs> because they are you know, evolutionarily and, uh, and uh, biologically programmed, right? And then we begin the sociocultural programming with education, you know, uh, with um, uh, uh, education, with what the par how the parents raise them, with, uh, uh, you know, the, the environment that they're in. So they're continuously getting programmed. And yes. uh, in fact, what, one of the things that I um, uh, use Interesting. So the script being the most open and integral and understanding the nature of mind and reality at the youngest age, that script. Yeah. And, and, and uh, also, you know, uh, aside from, from uh, I said, going, going the opposite, uh, in, it's teaching kids, you know, how to examine the contents of their consciousness and why they need to do so. It's an essential skill that will not make them suffer in the future. Exactly. Right? exactly. Because they know that they're just arising in consciousness, right? And the other thing is when it's too late for you, what I say is that, um, you know, uh, when you're 21, 22 years old or whatever, just go out and, and try to examine all of the beliefs that were placed in there by your yeah. parents by your siblings, by your teachers and everything, and see if they're still working for you. Yes. You know? yeah. uh, All the lines of code. Yeah, yeah th those, 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 uh, those may not be yours, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. As I say, you know, you can set something to false. You can, or my favorite is if you don't need the variable anymore, you put a semicolon. It, yeah, right? archive, like, archive some code and update that with some new lines that are it's, more integral. Yeah. Yes, and, and then, bearing that, if you're still old, older, it's like, what kind of molecules can we use in order to break through that, right? So yeah. you have DMT, yeah. you have uh, uh, psilocybin, you have MDMA, you know, you have all of these things that can break through. Uh, which is, you know, uh, they're used therapeutically, but they're also consciousness raising molecules. You know, they're they are non-addicting consciousness raising molecules. They're not addicting because they don't raise your dop dopamine at all, right? Yeah, you, we know the mechanism. We we know the mechanism for addiction, right? So so there's no more reason why they say, oh, these are because they cause addiction. They won't. Yeah, right? uh, the hack means, hacking your script. Um, I, I, yeah. I don't know of anyone who would like to take uh, ayahuasca for fun, right? Yeah, um, we, do yeah it to, although, we do it to hack our script. That's yeah. why we do it. Yeah, yeah. although, you know, I hacked ayahuasca to my version of it called pharmawasca because I didn't want to vomit, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a, which is the future. The no yeah. It's the no vomit ayahuasca because I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't for the life of me just, you know, yeah. Uh, continue vomiting. But these are the, 
the, you know, these are the kinds of, of things that are available, you know, um, on the flip side of uh, telling stories is, you know, uh, educating children, uh, teaching them how to, to, to meditate and, uh, you know, uh, and making it a practice and making it a habit for younger people to examine the contents of their consciousness. Right? For us, it's difficult, but if you start them young, it's easy for them because yes. it's like seeing your optic blind spot, as Sam Harris likes to say. You know, yeah. once it's pointed out to you, you cannot, you know, not remember seeing it, right? Yeah. And then uh, there's this uh, period where there's a time where you should examine what beliefs are in there. And, you know, and, and then we have now this uh, um, uh, psychedelics that allow us to investigate our mind and uh, allow us to change uh, our scripts uh, and so on. And uh, for me, it's, uh, as I like to say, those are like, bodybuilding steroids now you use them only for a while and then after that you will have to do the exercises yourself uh, off yeah. cycle right? yes you still yes have to have a continuous exactly practice. and and that's how you know for, for me like yes we're advancing in the world and and so on but are we alleviating the suffering of people so yes we have all of this high-tech stuff and we have all of this biometrics and so on and so forth but fundamentally you know uh, I'm not even saying uh, anything about happiness. You know, we're not wired for happiness. We're wired for survival and reproduction. Happiness is an inside job. But for me, happiness is not suffering. So, so if we can teach, it's a, it's a skill that can be learned, right? Um, observing the contents and not being identifying, as you said, not identifying with the ego or not identifying with the self-referential system and knowing that things just arise you know, these are just neural networks that fire, you know, um, as I like to say, as a neural network guy, you know, when you see something, your, your uh, visual neural network fires, when you hear something, your auditory neural network fires, you know, and it is in the same space where your uh, thoughts arise. They're also just neural networks firing where your emotions arise, your limbic system uh, neural networks are firing. They're all just neural networks firing. And if you could see that, that when, when they fire in such a way that there is, it seems that there is someone orchestrating them, that's where we actually get fucked up, right? When, they, when we, when we, when we, uh, when we, um, begin to own that we can control these things. That's why the most difficult thing in meditation, right? Is like, I want to control my thoughts. No, you can't. You have allowed them to go, right? Uh, and see that they, they disappear. They appear in the same space of consciousness as everything else. As what you see, what you hear, uh, you know, what you feel, you know, uh, the pressure in your body, the concept of you having a face uh, and so on. They're all appearing in the same consciousness space as where thought arises, where emotion arises. And it's a skill, you know, that can be taught to, to be able to see the arisings of those. And you could see suffering decrease. And when suffering decreases, then you could see creativity arises, right? Because you're not craving for something and more, right? You are, you are uh, in equanimity. Yeah. As, I, as I, I tell people, I don't like extreme happiness and deep whirlpools of sadness. Mm -hmm. I just like, you know, uh, gentle waves of things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yep. so, so when you learn, when you learn that, then you, you know, you can gamify it if yep. you want, right? Yeah. Uh, you we have friends that are doing things. that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and, and so you begin, you begin not to take yourself seriously exactly that's the levity piece yeah i agree i agree you begin not to take yourself seriously um yeah. you begin to see well you know what purpose you know it's like you set whatever purpose you like you know uh, mm -hmm. and so on it's like uh, you, you know uh, we we grow up thinking that you know there's purpose and meaning and, and so on and so forth and you realize like no you're the one setting all of that so you set your script properly you set your script Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you set your script. One more time. You set, <laughs> you your, script. set your script. script. However, you should be aware from where the script is coming, is coming from. You are yes. talking about the source. Exactly. Right? Where does, from where does the script arise? Beautiful. Yeah. 
Beautiful. From and before you could set the script, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and when there's fucked up scripts in there, man, because it's fucked up code. It's one hundred percent your <laughs> ability. Hundred percent. You can, like you said, contemplate what is written in there and um, go through the experiential practices. There's all these modalities to, for for that that exists now. Ted. Yes. yes. Okay. That last last thing. Yeah. Go ahead. Don't believe in what you think, right? I have this thing where I always say, um, um, and this would be a good end to your, uh, our podcast here. Yes, yes. Don't think, feel. Yeah. Don't feel, be. Be. Right? Yeah. I love it. So love don't it. think that you're love. Don't feel that you're love. Be love. Be itself. it. Mm. Mm. And then we just butterfly effect that out all over. I love that. I love it. Uh, That's the logo of Home Boat, by the way. Yes, it is. Yeah, I know. I know. That's everybody. You have to check out the links in the bio. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much for coming on the show and joining us. This has been so enlightening across so many different aspects. I've loved it. I've loved it. Um, and you can, guys, you can find so many of the things that Ted has been talking about in those links in the bio below. I highly recommend going to homehope.org and watching his fundamentals video. It breaks down a lot of the wisdom that he's been communicating in a very strong educational way. It's super awesome. Check that out. Also biobalanceinstitute.com and transcriptions.com. Check all of that out, all those links. And also um, continue supporting the artists, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the spiritual leaders in your communities and around the world that you believe in. You can support Ted. You can support us and our show. Our links are in the bio below as well. And go and build the future. Manifest your dreams and destiny into the world. Build that more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And get at the front of this massive evolution of biotechnology. Get at the front and share it and get inspired about that. This is the future. Be part of the major pseudopod of the amoeba <laughs> that brings the society along with it with enough momentum. That's right. Move, the pacer of the cultural zeitgeist is, is moving. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Much love. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you soon, everyone. Peace. Thank you.